Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Board Game Geek Show for August 23rd, 2018. I'm your host, Aldi, once again, joined by my lovely co-host, hosts, W. Eric Martin. Hey, everybody. Lincoln Damerst, Steph Hodge, <laughs> and Rodney Smith. Welcome back, Rodney. Hey, good to be back. I missed the last one. <laughs> Although he was he was on the live one, so that, he wasn't. That's really right. On. We did the live show from Gen Con where Rodney was there. We also got to play with Fireball Island on camera, so go check that uh, video out. That was from two weeks ago. Um, also, Gen Con videos are being edited. Um, and Eric, why don't you take take over from that and tell us what's coming from the video channel for Gen Con? We have about thirty videos or so published already for our Gen Con coverage. Uh, I'm not sure. I haven't been keeping track at this point what the numbers are. I published a few of my own that I had recorded separately off-site for games that are previewed at Gen Con that are coming for Spiel. If you want to go check out previews of Solenia or Martin Wallace's Lincoln, Quartermaster General of the Cold War, things that weren't on our channel. Despite us previewing more than 200 games or roughly during our live stream broadcast, that was definitely not all of it. So there's a lot more that will be coming on the playlist on our YouTube channel, Board Game Geek TV. They're almost all edited, too. I think Pep and Nikki are really cranking through them. Nikki will be done with day two today. Yeah, and I think Pep is just wrapping up. Uh, he's working on day four right now. So, so I think the Gen Con stuff will be done pretty soon. Those videos are being posted on our YouTube channel. And when needed or when relevant, I am including them in our Spiel 2018 preview, which has almost reached 500 titles at this point. Oh, my Because a lot of games... <laughs> a lot of games debut at Gen Con, but they're also kind of debuting at Spiel because they are pretty much different audiences, except for the 10% of people who are, you know, working at both or crazy enough to, to go do both. Um, so a lot of those videos are, are previews as well for games that will be coming out in Europe. Just another note from Gen Con, we got most of the new games. I want to say everything, but we got pretty much everything and brought it back through, uh, we filled up a truck, which we thought was going to be too small, or t sorry, too big, but we ended up just packing it to the gills with new games for BGG Con in November. Um, so that's exciting. Plus, when we go to Spiel, we bring back all those games for the, for the fall convention as well. So if you're coming to Board Game Geek Con in November, you're probably going to have about 1,500 games to choose from. That sounds amazing! <laughs> <laughs> That's ridiculous. You just feel like game till your eyeballs fall out. <laughs> it's kind of mind boggling. Like this year is just, I, I feel like uh, maybe just even a 10 to 15% growth, which in the, is like basically another 150 games that came out over last year, which obviously was just amazing too. So it's fantastic. I'm looking forward to playing some games. <laughs> I need some more free time. So many games. Game night's actually kind of in overdrive because there's a pile of games we want to feature. It's so much stuff. I had someone ask on a video that we posted from Gen Con saying, hey, did you get to try this game? And it's just like, no, I <laughs> experienced it for those five minutes and then it was just gone. Like there's no way to keep up with everything. And it's, it's hard because there's fans of everything and you have to disappoint them all the time because you're like, that was my sole experience with it. And I can't tell you anything else. Have fun. Go explore it yourself. It's like you lick your finger and put it up in the air to like test the wind. Is that like you're just sampling the temperature? That's all you can do at a certain point. It's just it, it just washes over you with all these I'm games. I'm doing and my like, best. This is amazing. Yes, <laughs> Steph is doing more than the rest of us put together. I'm probably, doing my best. In terms of sampling these games, Th that is absolutely the truth. So I saw Chaz's new show is up and running. So what what is that? Tell me about this. So on the 20th, Chaz debuted his new show, Who's Playing What? And I don't know if that's the real name, but that's the name right now. I actually like that name. I think we're going with that name. I, I think it's good. And it's basically the top played games by users, not, not plays. You have to have the most users playing. A player can play it 20 times, but it'll count as one. And he has a guest who's guessing the top played games. Now, you know, some of them are a little bit more esoteric maybe in the first show they're fantastic yeah gary pope from late to the table check out his youtube channel we'll put a little link to it he's hilarious and it looks so his set it's always got the most dramatic fantastic lighting it's like scott on the very first show of the board game geek show you know in the from the yeah, death, he's the death definitely star. in the cave it was yeah. awesome i love it in the death star uh, yeah, he always has the most dramatic lighting. It's so great. I was just I was just encouraged that he bombed on the first three 
guesses because it made me think if I ever get a chance to come on the show, he set the bar nice and low for the rest of us. <laughs> <laughs> well, he did really well because it was a, it, so the deal is is what happens is is you gain points, uh, pennies or whatever. Uh, yeah. For a gift certificates that somebody in the comments is going to win, and then he's like to make make it so that potentially some of the people that are in the comments will actually be the contestant to guess for the next winner. Um, but they end up uh, getting a, over seven, seventy five dollar gift certificate. So he get you get a half a penny for every unique player for that game. So if you choose like a high number of players, then it increases the value of the of the gift certificate. The other show Chaz debuted, which is on the 5th. So it's going to be the 5th and the 20th he's going to have his shows. It's not a, a day of the week. It's a day of the month thing that he's doing. And um, it's the top 10 games uh, from Board Game Geek on the hotness. And he'll look it over every month. And, of course, he's been doing it for a little while. Uh, and, of course, Gloomhaven's up there all the time. But uh, maybe some other new stuff will show up. Gloomhaven has been at the top of the hotness for 11 months straight. Come on. Come on, something new at Essen. That's what's good, though, about his top tens is he'll find some little aspect about Gloomhaven every time to talk about that he hasn't covered before. So he, even if you're seeing the same game again, he finds a new angle to come at it from, which I think is great. Well, I love having him on our channel. He's really funny and a great personality, and he is really doing some great stuff, so it's fantastic. Plus, he's programming for us. Hooray! Yay! Yeah. He's multi-talented. Absolutely. Did you <laughs> did you guys see his Gloomhaven tattoo? I did not. Oh, yeah. Well, you have to go watch the episode. He, did he get a real tattoo? Okay. No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, another Board Game Geek event news. The tickets for BGGCon Spring 2019 will be going on sale next month, September 2018 so if that didn't confuse you check the website for details uh, we're all going to be there and so you can come visit all of us plus play the tons of games that will be out i'm sure by next year or half the games from this year that will be left over from last year there's just so many games it's ridiculous we'll probably be bringing our full library of six thousand games again uh, we haven't find we haven't finalized any details about the spiel de jarez games being there but we probably think they're going to be there so Check those tickets out soon. Also, the BGG Cruise is going to be announced uh, in August, later this month in August 2018 for the 2019 Cruise. Sorry for all the date confusion, but I wanted to make sure I was being clear as mud. So <laughs> that's it for Board Game Geek events. Keep, keep looking on the site for more information right on the front page. I'm already booked on the cruise. That's right. There was a great uh, cruise bonus booking, like a discount if you booked from the previous cruise. That's all, Royal Caribbean always does that. And it's very nice that it stacks using Gamer Parlance. That, uh, it stacks with the bon benefits that we get if you get booked through the Board Game Geek um, cruise. And listen, if you couldn't get into BGG Con because the tickets sold out, keep an eye out for BGG Spring. It's a fantastic convention. I just When I went uh, this past year, I just gamed nonstop the entire time. If you like to game, this is a great convention. Giant library, lots of friendly people, lots of gaming there. I had so much fun, I still have my wristband on. Oh my gosh. <laughs> wow. <laughs> You're going to be one of those That's gross incredible. people with this bat, this wristband on. It's all gross. No, it's wonderful. You and Krusty. They get, yeah, it's talk wonderful. to Krusty and then go look at all the comments that people had about that. You're, be prepared <laughs> for grossness. Do not look at those comments. Never read the comments. Don't read the, don't read the comments. Maybe I can make it to, oh. to fall and then I can, you know, have one ongoing for the whole year. I believe there was some mention of atomization in there too. So I don't know. It was gross. <laughs> Aerial, aerialization? I don't yeah. know what is it called. Yeah. I can't okay. <laughs> what just happened? Don't read that. You don't want to know what that wristband, what, what's on that wristband. <laughs> <laughs> well, you only have to wear it for a few more months because, you know, we'll be in, gaming in November pretty soon. She's going to wear both of them. All right, let's move on to everybody's favorite segment. What have you been playing? Let's start with Steph. I know you've been playing a ton. I've been reading your blog. So I, I put out some next to me here, and they all have something in common, which is tiling, which is something I just really love. Um, so I've been playing these ones a lot. Um, Brothers is a super awesome two-player or team-playing game with you're laying out the map as you go, and then you have to try and play these tiles. So a one by three or like a corner piece, three piece. So they're trying to play against you and your teammate or just two player, which you just go back and forth. You're trying to play all your pieces. It's awesome. It's very fast and you get to play both sides and I'd love it. So that's been a super hit every time I play it. Um, and I got Spring Meadow, the next one, the third one in the series. 
um, for Uwe Rosenberg and, you know, Cartage Garden and Indian Summer. For me, this one was awesome. Uh, it, 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 it combines Cottage Garden and Indian Summer best. So it, I think it, it replaces both of them for me. I don't know. <laughs> so I don't know. Did you, did anybody else get to play Spring Meadow? No? You're done. You're done with that one. I really like it. Um, so it's kind of tetris -y. You're building up and trying to get points and, um, there's good catch up thing going on and I, it plays out really fast. I, I love tiling games. I think I would like that one the best because you have enclosures too, right? You're trying, are you, are yeah. you trying to enclose things? Yeah. That, that seems to add another little twist to the game that I would probably like. It, it makes it a little bit friendlier in that you get multiple scorings to try and catch up versus Indian Summer, which is strictly a race game to complete your board. Now, I haven't played any of them. Is one of them, is this latest one the most complex of all three, would you say? Like, which is the easiest or the hardest to learn? Um, no, actually, I would probably say Indian Summer is a little bit more complex because there's a little bit more scoring situations happening. Okay. Um, so, yeah, I think Spring Meadow is a little bit more mainstream. It combines the nice things about Indian Summer because you're trying to still cover up the, the little marmot holes and get extra points that way. Um, but there isn't the added tokens, what this does, this does, this does kind of thing. So, of in course. Indian Summer, you have a you have rows of tiles and you're kind of mentally puzzling how you're gonna work different things in and you can possibly steal tiles from other players. Other players and, and so you're kind of putting that all together at once. Whereas Spring Meadow, it's more like you just have I know what I can get this time, and here's possibly what's available next time. And that's kind of your look yeah. ahead is limited. So it's a little easier yeah. just because you have less to think about. Definitely less, ta it's more tactical because you're dealing with the situation at hand on your turn versus I can plan out like four turns in advance for Indeed Summer. <laughs> yeah. Um. And I just want to mention one more because I really like games. <laughs> And it's Woodlands because this is like, this is Looney Quest, but with tile placement. So you're trying to create a path with these tiles and then you have the overlay that goes on top. You're trying to score the most points, get little red to Granny's house. And there's a story, the, the fairy tale stories. And oh, it's totally right up my alley. I, I just want to play more and more and more. <laughs> Yeah, I wanted to try to play that with you at Gen Con, but I didn't get a, t get a chance to. So so I'm glad uh, that you like it. I'll definitely play it soon. Well, we played a game you recommended, Skylands, from Shunanaya Taguchi. And it's really actually quite good. It's not it's not out yet. It's a pre-production copy that was handmade. Um, but it is really, really great. It's uh, based on King of Frontier, which I never played. I know that Scott played it, right? I might have tried to play it. <laughs> <laughs> well, Many times it sat there. <laughs> it's really, really good. And the um, it's a super tight board that you're trying to put these... You're drafting... You have four different actions that you can do each turn. And when another... You know, it's like Puerto Rico style. When somebody chooses it, you all get to choose it. as what, Do the same action, but they get a benefit. and uh, Or San Juan. And it... It's, it's really great because you're trying to build it. I did. I played terribly. I had I had no idea. Like I don't even know what my strategy was at the beginning of the game. But I ended up doing okay, and we got creamed by somebody else. I won't mention. Um, but uh, it really is well done. And look for it because it's coming soon from Queen Games, and it will be a little bit it, difficult. It was to definitely get. one of my favorites that I got to try at Gen Con. Um, I have already loved the original, and then they, they tweaked it to make it more colorful and <laughs> always a easy for to you. understand. <laughs> so that that was a huge bonus for me, and I can't wait for that one as well. <laughs> it seems like it would play pretty quickly too. I saw you guys play it, and it like you could probably knock it a four player game out in maybe thirty minutes. I would think. Yeah, I would. I think once you got it all ironed out, what you're doing, yes, absolutely. We also played Everdell, which was a recommendation from Scott. It's from James A. Wilson and Starling Games. And holy cow, is that game fantastic. It is, you know, 
the great one of the best things about it is it's thematically so fun. You're a, it's a bunch of creatures building stuff, and it is really really well done. Uh, just neat interactions, and it's one of those. A uh, little bit like Seven Wonders, where if you have one thing that you've built, you can automatically get something else. Basically, one of the the worker inside that. If you have like the general store, you get the shopkeep or something like that. And then they all have special powers, and it's over uh, one year. So you start off in winter, and you go through you switch from spring to summer to fall, and everyone. Um, it's not you're not doing it at the same time. I mean, you're all playing turns around and around, but you switch seasons in different times because I guess of the microclimates or whatever. Somebody's in the mountains, but it's really, really well done. This is the season of animal games. I, I think that and Root were the games that I was hearing the most about at Gen Con that people were picking up. Everdell was in everyone's bag or people had just played it. The production looks really, really uh, engaging. Super cute. and Oh, it is yeah. it is unbelievably gorgeous. The, deluxe, the collector's edition or whatever is one of the nicest collector's editions I've ever seen. Yeah, don't let the cute art, which is amazing, by the way, and all the there's lots of funny quotes and stuff, and all the animal, all the critters. Yeah. Um, but don't let the art fool you. The game is great. It has a lot of interesting tactical play, um, and maybe some strategic long term stuff. That if you plan right, you could get your combinations going. It's really cool. I want to play it more. Definitely vying for my top ten of the year. Putting it that high. I'm with you 100 percent on that. I've been dying to. I've been thinking about Everdell since we played it. And we don't really get to play games for fun all the time. And we're filming on Saturday, so I'm going to try. I mean, I'm having fun playing games. But you know what I'm saying? Where we're not on camera and we can all scratch things we need to scratch and not worry about it. And uh, <laughs> it is... it is Need some cream, buddy. It's, it's, uh, you might want to see a doctor about yeah, that. Yeah, it's true. It's fantastic, man. And I really, really am looking forward to it. So maybe Saturday we'll, we'll work it in. I was just going to say game night and street jackets. The other game we played at Gen Con that was uh, not really a lot of buzz, but boy, all of us uh, young people from the 80s and 90s love it, is the Monster Crunch, which is based on the General Mills characters of Count Chocula, Frankenberry, Fruit Brute, Boo Berry, and... Yummy Mummy. <laughs> Yummy Mummy. Okay, there you go. Uh, they're so great. It is a really... Hey, he's holding it right there. It is a really, really fun game. Um and it's a light enough, but it's got the kind of strategy of a ladder game that people won't know. And it's got some a neat wrinkle in the way that you play, because uh, you're just trying to get rid of your cards. And you can't play multiple cards unless you have a milk token to play them. And the only way you get milk tokens is br by dropping out in the uh, in the round. Because each round, then the whole hand, you have a hand of 12 cards. Everybody has 36 cards numbered 1 to 12. You have three of each. And you mix them up and you draw 12 and you play them out and it is really well done and i think it's a great opportunity to draw new people into the game into the hobby because it will be at target and i'm sure it won't be terribly expensive and it's got some neat stuff going on really well done and the components are all great like you have your own everyone has their own little cereal bowl and you put the your your cards into that i don't know are these made of some kind of like milk proof plastic or something it's a different material yeah they you do feel that? different you should test that rodney <laughs> I, I should test that Put later. Milk in your box. See how that works out. <laughs> I was just chuckling thinking about this because Steph was talking about a game where you're covering up marmot holes. We're now pouring cereal and milk. Uh, the themes in games now are just going in all directions. And I mean, it's even them thematically appropriate. You can play more cereal if you have milk to put with it because of course cereal goes down much better with milk than just dry right so <laughs> well that one's that one's from forest present creative who seem to be doing all this fantastic stuff with ip they did villainous as prospero hall i believe from wonder yep. forge but this one's big g creative and it is great they had four new games that were all ip based and they were all i was hearing good things about all of them they had the brady bunch game the Home Alone game, and another Bob Ross game. So it's amazing. And, and they had one of the best promotions. When you bought the game, Monster Crunch, you got a box of actual cereal with it. <laughs> Absolutely. It was fantastic. So brilliant. <laughs> Which one did you get, Steph? Chocolate, of course. Oh, okay. Well, I, I would have wanted, like, Boo Berry or uh, Frankenberry, probably. I'm not a chocolate guy. Oh, I'm so chocolate all the way. Okay. <laughs> so speaking of Forest Prison, I played another game designed by that creative team over there which is amazing uh called yeah nope and you may have seen the box i wish i had it it you the box has these like what are those things called sequins sequins, sequins. sequins. you flip yeah, them yeah. back and forth and it spells it and they and you 
you rub the box one way and it says yeah, and you rub it the other way and it says nope. Did you see the shirts at Gen Con? Oh, do they make shirts too? Florian had a shirt that was the yeah, nope shirt because it's Wonder Forge uh, Robinsberger. Right, but designed through the the Force yeah, Brazan, the creative team, yeah. right? Yep. Yeah, Force Brazan. Um, yeah, that's a, it's really interesting how many games they had that we all really liked this year. So it is a game of, it's a social party game. So you get a hand of 10 cards and on the 10 cards are statements such as I went to the opera or I slept walked, sleepwalked. How do you say it? Sleepwalk? <laughs> sleepwalked. Uh, or I, um, what is it? There was, there was some very, very weird ones like. I got drunk and did something s- stupid or, you know, there's all these kind of like questions or they're, they're statements that you play as yourself and they have to be semi-believable, right? So um, if I went camping in the, in the Rocky Mountains, I, you know, that would be unbelievable for me. So I would never <laughs> play that card. <laughs> so you have to pick something believable. So let's say uh, I pick, um, I dated a married woman or something like that, right? And it, I think it's non-sexual specific, but so you would pick, play that card and then everyone has to stay in for the first round and come up with a completion part for that question. So let's say, and it ended badly. So you guys as a group would come together and pick a card and say, yeah, it ended badly. Okay. Wow, Scott, this and is, then I you're would revealing do, something Yeah, here. yeah. <laughs> this is, <laughs> but that's the thing. You say that, but, so I would then go, yeah, or nope, right? If I just do a nope, it's over, and nobody really scores anything. So you kind of want to have these kind of situations where you want to keep pushing down the line, because I say, yeah, it ended badly. And then you guys want to, if you want to stay in, you put your card in your, you, you all came up with a group as a nut with another ending and they don't stack. So it would be like, um, and I did it more than once, right? Like, so that that's another one of the endings and everybody decides if they want to stay in or not. If you drop out, you, you score points that way you scored, but if you stay in, you're like pushing your luck, right? You could score more points. And then I do the, yeah, nope. Right. Let's say, yeah, <laughs> I'm making this up, by the way, sure. just for purposes of explaining the game. So then, there, so there's, so there's a lot of different of ending cards, and they flip over when you use them. So you get all these kind of different endings to the story. But the really the the key part of the game, it's that's fun to kind of explore and know, get to know your friends. I think you kind of have to know people a little bit to play this game, um, or get to know people you don't know anything about. Because at the end, I tell my story. Right. So I explain, well, yeah, I did have that affair with a married woman back in the 80s. And I was, you know, it just ended terribly. And this is what happened. So you tell the story. And so some of the stories that I've heard so far. That is awesome. Some of them are very like things I maybe didn't need to know or but like some things that basically <laughs> made, endeared me to my friends. Right. Like more more stories about their history and back. So it's a party game. Social. The scoring is kind of whatever. But uh, it's there to like kind of make you go down and push your luck a little bit on the on the endings. Um, I would suggest to try it with your friends. So that's yeah, nope. <laughs> it's in Target, like twenty bucks. Very, it's very cheap. And the box is cool, so you get to play with the box. Um, yeah. It's all about the box. <laughs> so the other game I've been playing uh, recently is uh, the darling of BGG's hotness called Root by uh, Cole Worley and uh, published by Leader Games. And it is a asymmetric war game in dressed up with very, very cute woodland animals. You have cats. Well, little cats don't really live in the woods, but these cats do. You have birds, you have the woodland folk, and you have um, the vagabond who is a raccoon. So and there, and there's an expansion, I think, with lizards and- uh, Are you sure you're not describing Everdell? <laughs> I know, right? It's another game themed about cute animals. The cool thing about this one is every race of animals is a unique asymmetric powers, right? So as a cat, I want to like dominate the forest and like build a whole bunch of buildings and sawmills and recruit a bunch of army and like do that and dominate everything. Um, the birds want to put their roosts out and the their, the woodland alliance wants to cause rebellion in the forest and then the the vagabond wants to like go on quests and find items and craft things so very like kind of D ish 
So each player plays one race or one role, and um, it is strictly a war game. So don't let that fool you. It is you are fighting people, you are killing their units and things. So it's a, got a bit of a mean streak. So if you have the, that kind of problem in games, don't play this. Scott, don't you normally not like that in games? Yeah, you're right. I don't normally like a conflict-based game, but if if the game is all conflict, and there's like no like euro elements to it, like like let's say feudum, then I'm okay with it. Like, it's just risk to me. Then it's just like every action I do has to hurt you in some way, which, you know, it is what it is, right? So you, you go through and you um, you try to accomplish your your, your specific way to win. Um, it's very cool, like very intriguing. The two games I played of it ended completely differently. Um, the birds have sort of like a Robo Rally programming element to it, like where you pre-program your move. Um, and if you can't actually execute your move, the birds revolt and overthrow their leader, and then a new bird leader comes into the game. It's very cool. Um, the woodland folk can do an uprising and just kill all of your units very easily, so you can't have like this huge army. The, the revolt will kill you. So it's got like all, a, lot of cool, a lot of cool things going on. I want to play it more. I want to try the other races. So um, it's, and it's, uh, it's a little bit hard to learn, I guess, in the first time, because you kind of have to know what everybody's abilities are, which is, you know, you do, yours is different from the other person. So you kind of like, well, what are you doing over there? Oh, yeah, I, all right, I know what you're doing. So it takes a little bit of a learning curve, but it um, wasn't too hard in the end. Yeah. Um, I haven't played Root. I'm not sure. Yeah. I'm not sure it's really my type of game, but it's so cute that I, I want to know. But um, is it very much like Vast, or like would you compare the two, or like... I wasn't a huge fan of Vast, I didn't mind it, though. I can see elements of Vast in there because everybody sort of has their own goal um, and different mechanics, but it's really, it's really a war game. Like, I'll be attacking you and... Is it, is it easier to learn than Vast? I, maybe a little bit easier to learn than Vast because in the end you're just moving your things around and like doing attacks and stuff. Um, I, like, I haven't played the other two races, so I don't know what those guys do. Um, but every race does have its own set of rules still, right? 100%. Like, they're so different. Yeah. Like, you're like, wow, that's that's kind of... That's the really great thing about the game. I admire that this is so, supposedly balanced. I felt the birds were just crushing. Like, they would just crush the whole board. Because the birds can spawn very quickly and move around very fast. And, but, uh, and I played the cats a couple times, so that was fun. But I couldn't... I had a hard time dealing with the revolts because, like, when you attack the person who has the the Woodland Alliance, um, you give them cards, and that's currency for them, right? And they can cause more revolts. So you kind of don't want to attack them, but if you don't attack them, they're going to win the game because they're putting out their their uh, uprising tokens. So it has all these weird kind of interesting balances and, like, if I do, don't do that, he's going to... You have to keep everybody in check, if that makes any sense, right? Like, you can't let anybody just do their thing. So that causes a lot of conflict, or it should, because if you don't attack one person or knock them, you know, knock down their infrastructure, they're going to win. So you have to kind of keep going around and and fighting. Fighting a lot. So it's definitely a high-conflict game. If that is up your alley, it's probably not as bad as Eclipse. I think in Eclipse like getting the fighting in that is pretty devastating. So anyway, I, you should at least play it one time. You, you'll learn it. You'll pick it up very quickly. I'm nervous, nervous with the teaching curve on it, but I really want to try it. I, I ordered a copy too, because it sounds, sounds really good. One of the very cool things in the game is a, a two turn walkthrough for four players. And you just do what it says on the walkthrough. So that takes you two turns through the game. Oh, nice. And it's, it seems like a game where really you should just focus on learning your own faction. I did the, the demo with Cole at Gen Con. It sounds wonderful, but it also sounds like something I will not play enough to fully appreciate. So often I just don't bother playing once. But it sounds like something where you should really learn your faction and not even worry about what other people can do. And just discover that as you play. And of course, uh, maybe you, you will get thrashed by someone doing something you didn't expect, but that seems like a better learning experience than taking an hour to cover the depth of what everyone can do. I just speaking for my own prior preferences. It seems overwhelming at first, but really it wasn't that big a deal. It was, 
I mean, I guess maybe experience a game, a game, games like this, but um, it you learning my race. The cats were very straightforward. That's like a low complexity one. The birds were a little more higher complexity, and then the the woodland alliance was very high complexity, and then the vagabond was like medium or something. So it's like you could learn your your own race for sure, but definitely to play it properly, you need to know what other people are doing to stop them, right? Like if if you see something happening with the birds, like you got to try to mess up. Remember, they're a program movement, right? So if you mess up one of their moves, they they were they have an upper they have a revolt internally or whatever civil war i forget what it's called but they overthrow the leader and it like they lose points actually so you want to try to stop the birds like and then you can't let the alliance get too spread out because they get points for all their chips on the board so you definitely have to kind of know it a little bit but yeah learning your one race is that is is the where to start from and then as you go you'll learn the other ones as you see them dominate you (laughs) if you leave if you leave any race to be they will win that's that's basically kind of how it goes. Eric, what have you been playing? I have played the opposite of Root, <laughs> I think. Uh, just one. Probably. A party game that you explain in one minute. You'll finish in 20 before you have learned Root. <laughs> it's just one faction. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. There is one faction. It's a cooperative game in which everyone is trying to guess 13 secret words. So one person is the guesser for the round. Everyone else looks at the secret word. They write down a one word clue. They compare those clues among themselves. And if anyone has written down the same clue, then those clues are discarded and the guesser doesn't see those. And then the guesser hopefully looks at the clues and can guess the word. If you do, you score a point. If they are unsure, maybe they want to pass, then you just throw that point away. If they guess incorrectly, you lose that card and a card that you previously scored. It's super hard. So ideally, no mistakes over 13 rounds and you'll win. I just posted a video on that recently. Uh, another game talking about uh, interesting themes. Shibuya is a two player game about crossing a street, which is based on the famous intersection in Tokyo in the Shibuya district, which just is massive and just thousands of people crossing the street all the time. And it, it's really like a thing. It feels like a thing and you're, when you're in the midst of it, looking around the area going through here and you're just trying to cross the street before the other player can you build the board ahead of time with routes across the street is is the whole game eric just getting from one side of the street to the other yes it is i feel like the meeples (laughs) should be a chicken and you're crossing over this way and you can play a four-player game where the opposite teams are going opposite ways and trying to do stuff. It is Japanese. I don't know if they'd have that chicken crossing the road thing going on there but i tried to meet ken shota there that was where I was meeting him with Eric Lang, and holy cow, you can't see anybody. Thank goodness Eric and I stuck out, so he saw us, because <laughs> wow, it's crazy down there. It, it is it is quite populated. Uh, the other game, and I'm going to be doing a video on this soon, because now i played this a few times, Orbis by Tim Armstrong, coming from Space Cowboys at Spiel 2018. They were demoing this at Gen Con, and I got to take a copy home to try out, which I played a few times now with two and three players. And it's a world building game. You all represent gods that you are drafting universes or worlds and then putting them in this pyramid shape where you're going to build layers on the bottom. And if I have a blue and a green world, then the one above it needs to be blue or green or else I can make it a wilderness that's all colors, but it's going to cost me points and blah, blah, blah. And so it has that simplicity of splendor where you are drafting things that you pay for with worshipers, which are conveniently in the shape of cubes, easy for you to handle. And as you pick a world from the draft display, all the adjacent worlds get a worshiper on them. I guess the worshipers are like fleeing from the world as you're picking it up and they go, ah, they fall on the worlds next to it. You can <laughs> decorate the gameplay as you like when you do that. And you're, you're trying to meet all these different conditions for different types of worlds as you build your pyramid the universe which will have a god tile at the top and there is very straightforward very space cowboys ish and uh, two to four players two players very different from three just because it's just you and me drafting things so i know what your choices are and i play off that so it's pretty neat rodney what have you been up to well with all these exciting themes i've got something a little bit more like traditional we're going back to well one of the hundreds ad's or something with architects 
of the West Kingdom, and we've got one of those kings who wants to have his land developed uh, beautifully, and we're all competing architects who want to do the best job and impress the king. And this is a worker placement game with a twist. Now this is from the uh, Garfield games, uh, the same uh, publishing group and designer as uh, Raiders of the North Sea, for example, another uh, popular uh, worker placement game with a twist. This one has, you know, your traditional board of places you could put your workers, but you get 20 workers. And what's interesting about how you place them is you, on your turn, you just place one of them. You find somewhere on the board to place them. Like say, uh, I want to go into the forest here, okay? Now these aren't magnetized, so it just fell, but he's in the forest. <laughs> and, it, and, it, and when he goes in the forest, he gets to have wood. Okay, nothing special there. But then I put a second, on my next turn, I put another worker there. Okay, and now there's two of them, so I get two wood. Then I put a third worker there on the next turn, I get three wood. Pretty soon, I'm a wood-making machine over here, because I've got a whole team of guys. But there's not just, like, the forest, there's places to get silver and gold, and other kinds of them. I mean, those are the straightforward locations. But eventually, you see somebody, they're getting a little too much of, of a good thing going for them. So what you can do, Rodney's got is you too can go much into wood. the... Too much wood, you got too much wood. So you go into the town center here, and, and you put one of your workers, and now you can send to your thugs to go out and like round those that, that gang up and you can capture them. So if someone starts putting a whole bunch of their workers in one location, you can then go in and, and capture them like I might do with my guy here. And I put them in my little, my little uh, holding cell here. And so now I'm holding some of your workers. And then later, if I want to, I can come up with one of my other workers. Here, I got another one here in my hand. And I stick it in the, in the what is this? The guardhouse, okay? And then I can take the workers and, and put them in the jail. And I get a buck for each of those workers. So I don't want to hang on to your workers forever because they're, they're going to be, I can turn them into money, which will help me uh, <laughs> later on. And so then Slavery. you can come to the guardhouse later and you can take your workers back. Uh, you know, there's, there's just, the, 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 the play with, with the, the exchanging and manipulation of the workers on the board is really interesting. Uh, how uh, going to more than one location over and over again or sorry, going to the same location over and over again powers it up. Some of these spaces, they aren't as simple as just gathering wood. Some of it's like doing uh, one of three possible actions. So once I've got three workers there, I could do that, those actions like three times. And so uh, it, it's, it's all about, ultimately, the objective of the game is to get points. Uh, you're trying to build uh, buildings. And those are the things that require the wood and the gold and, and the marble and things that you're building. And you also have uh, a whole series of of uh, recruits, basically, other artisans that you can recruit that will help you build those buildings and give you additional powers. So when you go to those different locations, you get a boost or you get some end game bonuses. Uh, the game will end once everyone has, uh, once this sort of guild hall area is filled up. So that's one of the other places you can go, but these workers you never get back. They start to fill in these spaces. That's where you go to build the buildings. And it's also where you can go work on the church here. And that will sort of have a limited number of spaces you can go into as you climb up the church ladder. So that you want to go up there as quickly as possible if you're focusing on that to get the most money. But it also includes, the last thing I'll just say here, is there's a virtue track over here. Because as you do, um, you can go to the black market and do some dirty deeds down here. Dunder but that cheap. will affect your virtue. <laughs> get things dirt cheap. You can, uh, yeah, there's a few little nasty things you can do down here. But the problem is, eventually you're going to have to... Um, uh, there's a little reckoning uh, that happens occasionally in the game, and then uh, the black market people will go to the jail as well, where they'll have to be reclaimed. But if your virtue goes too low, you can't work on the cathedral anymore. But you pay less taxes. <laughs> <laughs> like they, yeah, we don't want you to work on the church here. You need to go do some good deeds and then get yourself back up. And likewise, if you go too high on the virtue track, uh, although you get points, you can no longer do the black market item. So it's got a, a neat mix of a bunch of little things we've seen before, but with some interesting twists, especially around the worker placement. And I played this two player, had a really good time, but I can see how with even more players, that enjoyment would just escalate even more so. So I am, um, yeah, I had a really good time playing this one and it's one that I am uh, hoping to cover uh, and do a video for as well. So we will, we will see. No official announcement there, but that's the plan. Oh, and last, last but not least, each of the, uh, the, the clans types, they're double-sided, so you can uh, have a little bit of variability even in terms of uh, what your player can do. That sounds really cool. So it's not in the world of the Viking stuff. No, it's. I think it's, it's, it's the same artwork style. Yeah, same artwork, same style, sort of aesthetic, aesthetically, but uh, not connected to those other totally games huh. in any direct way. Okay. Yeah, it looks really cool. And I think normally Renegade Games has been has been bringing those games over. So this is probably one. Hopefully, we'll see in the Renegade Games line here in North America. So that was only available through Kickstarter. Yeah, right? originally. That's right. Initially, yeah. it was a Kickstarter game, and uh, I I'm, I was fortunate here to get an early copy. I wanted to try it first before I committed to doing a video for it. And, uh, okay, spoiler, I'm going to do a video for it. <laughs> it's definitely Renegade Games, so if that's yeah. the question. 
So keep an eye out for that soon. Well, that's a lot of games. And we barely scratched the surface of Gen Con, like, from that half an hour of talking about games. So let's move on to news. That was most of them. And new releases. <laughs> it was not most of them. Oh my gosh. <laughs> So news. One of the big exciting news announcements I think came out last week. Of course, that doesn't mean anything to you if you're watching this video next year. But in August of 2018, Gale Force 9 announced that they are bringing back Dune games. Yes. Uh, uh, let me clarify. They have a right license here? to release board games and miniature games and tabletop role-playing games. That's a very specific phrase. So it's not just a straight RPG, but I guess kind of a combination of the two. They have a license to release those in the Dune universe from all the Dune books and the new Dune movie that is in the works. This is not a license to bring back the original Dune game. That, that just to be clear. Okay. Yeah, I don't think that game will be coming back. That, that game, yeah, long in the dust, probably never coming back. We can write it off. No, the small history, least, uh, Fantasy the, Flight Games... Way back, 2008, 2007, actually, I believe, they had they had announced a new version of Borderlands from Something the like Cosmic Encounter designers, and they had announced Rex, a, a game that would use the Dune Wheels Within Wheels game system from the Cosmic Encounter guys, but in the Twilight Imperium universe, because they could not get the license for Dune, they could not do that. I had an interview with Peter Alotka I did back in 2008 where he just said, yeah, it's like talking to mud. They're not doing it. Well, 10 years have passed. Uh, the mud's grown up and signs contracts now. And they have they have made a deal. Gale Force 9 has made a deal. But again, this is for new games. They're going to work with other publishers so the first thing that they're talking about is a design with Modifius, which is a tabletop role-playing experience. You know, we'll get more details on that when they actually talk about it. They only give this news. So they're working with other companies and there could be other deals, but everything has to go through Gale Force 9 in order to make it happen. And as the movie is due in, I believe, 2020... You know, we won't really start hearing details of those games for a little while. I'm surprised they didn't say it was like talking to sand. I don't know. Talking to mud is definitely not a dune kind of a thing. <laughs> well, I'm hoping for a deck builder game with all of the different houses and the the well, uh, the witches. I can't remember what they're called, but there there was so many Bene Gesserit. <laughs> Bene Gesserit. How could I forget? And I'm sure the spice it will and all flow that stuff will be there. So it's a great. <laughs> It will flow. The spice it must will flow, flow with this license. <laughs> <laughs> it must flow. <laughs> News out of Gen Con that we didn't talk about during the live show because I think we didn't have real details at the time. It's still kind of a mystery. But Stronghold Games is paired up with Indie Boards and Cards, which bought Action Phase Games in 2016. And now those three brands will be in one company called Indie Game Studios. And yet the brands will still remain separate. So Travis Worthington, who ran Indie Boards and Cards, will be the official president of the entire company. And Stephen Bonacore will be a spokesperson for all three brands, which it seems like those are ideal roles for both of them. I will just say <laughs> uh, Bonacore as spokesperson is, is perfect for him. And Travis as guy behind the scenes getting everything done. That sounds great. Um, the brands will remain independent and they will each have their own spaces and their own announcements and their own universes, I suppose, if you talk about the dystopian universe and then the action phase universe with Aeon's Zen and Stronghold doing Terraforming Mars, all those are gonna be independent and doing their own thing. And more details about how that actually works, but it's kind of a behind the scenes, getting everything together, make everything flow more smoothly, all that stuff that comes from uh, people joining forces and merging that's invisible to the actual gamers for the most part. Yeah, both those companies are really small, really the definition of indie. And so they're kind of coming together to kind of grow grow the brands and uh, compete globally. So that's an interesting interesting consolidation of a uh, industry. It's funny because they're indie, but I don't know if they're necessarily that small. I mean, IBC sells a huge amount of coup. I mean... 
surprisingly large number of coup. So I think it's it's sort of invisible in terms of hobby terms, and it's just there's tons of people playing it, but uh, I forget what the the actual numbers are. But I know it's more than a million. So it's a lot. You could say mi- millions of ga- millions of copies. Yeah, it's a lot of stuff out there. In other game mergers and acquisitions is the uh, greater than games buying cheap ass games. I know uh, James Ernest had mentioned to me a while back that he wanted to sell to just design now. He doesn't want to run the business. He just wants to design. I think he's doing a Martin Wallace kind of a thing there, which is cool. I mean, might see some more stuff from him if he's not having to worry about actually getting the games produced and selling them. (laughs) Spoke with someone briefly at Gen Con about that, and that deal will be finalized in early 2019. So I don't think they've even even officially announced it. It just sort of they let word Ah. at the convention. Well, it's it's interesting. Yes. It's you know, there's actually quite a bit of interesting stuff from cheap ass games. I I really Button Man, he showed the new version of that at Gen Con and I really love that game. I've always thought that was a fun game. The idea of wearing the button that you'd have your character and then you just carry some dice with you to play it was just fantastic. I'd never played that game before and I did, actually did the preview video, so that was my first exposure to it, and I thought the system sounded fantastic. And then he has that uh, abstract game Tack, which is really good as well. So I think, um, yeah, if it frees him up to do a little more design work, it sounds like it's going to be a nice nice pairing for both of them. Rodney, you had something else you want to talk about, game-specific, unlike us talking about companies and deals. Yeah, and yeah. I, well, there's a, there's a game that F, uh, Fantasy Flight Games announced called uh, Discovery Lands Unknown. And they're often announcing games. That's not such a big deal. But this is another game in their unique game system. And if you watched our last live from Gen Con, uh, Board Game Geek Show, uh, Eric and I gushed and raved about Keyforge, which was the first game in their unique game system. And when they announced Keyforge and said, hey, we got this unique game system, I thought, okay, well, you're kind of like, you're, you're creating a brand around one game. Well, just as we were barely getting our heads around Keyforge, they announced a second game in this line which I'm not even sure, is it harder to understand or easier? I don't know yet. But basically, this is a full board game where uh, thematically you're going to be playing as survivors trying to survive in in, uh, some kind of land. But every copy of the game will be unique. So when I buy my copy of the game, the characters that are in there, the tiles and the places that we're going to, the quests that we're doing, the enemies we're going to face, the items we're going to use, A unique random, I don't don't want to say random, but it's a unique combination compared to every other copy of the game in existence, apparently. So, well, in your game, you might be climbing a mountain and having to deal with, like, cold weather and lack of food. I might be playing in my copy of the game with my friends in a jungle, being attacked by tigers and other things. Like, it's... Well, first of all, um, I have to say I really am excited in a way to see a large company like Fantasy Flight Games doing something that is, I think, ambitious, uh, also innovative, and they committed to this before they even saw how Keyforge did as a concept. So obviously this is is something as a company they wanted to sort of throw their weight behind and say, I think we've got something interesting here and we're going to put it out there and and see how it works. And uh, they certainly could have waited to see how Keyforge was received before they tried to throw a second game at us, but I think it shows they have a commitment to this, this system. I just think it's I think it's fascinating. Did you guys see this announcement as well? It sounds really cool. Uh, Corey Kaneska is the designer, and Corey right. was on our show at Gen Con talking about Keyforge. And it's kind of funny because, of course, he said nothing about this. This was an announcement after the convention. But I'm sure it was all stewing in his mind as he was talking about Keyforge and the unique ideas and trying to pull this all together. And, yeah, it sounds amazing. It's kind of interesting, too, to think... It's a $60 game, unlike Keyforge where it's $10 for a deck. So right. if you buy this, it's pretty it's it's a big commitment to the game and yet while we're, you know, we play for a while and then Rodney and I can trade copies. It doesn't sound there's no legacy element. There's nothing that that gets permanently altered. It's just the game itself is different. So then we could trade copies and have completely different experiences while still knowing the same game. So that sounds fascinating just that idea. Is the rule book the same between each of the games? Oh, that's a good good question. I believe so. It seems like it will be because they talk about the environment and the tiles and the items and the characters and all these other kind of external things being 
unique, or at least the combination huh. of them being unique. But it seems like the rules themselves will be the same. Kind of reminds me of 504 a little bit. Just with a combination of rules? Although the, they're at, the rules change depending on yeah. what modules you use. That's true. I mean, this could be if I'm going to go explore an area, that's going to be the same whether that area turns out to be a desert or a woodlands or a swamp or whatever it is. Right. There might be some keywords around that location that change that make the forest behave a little differently than, say, the mountains. But maybe the overall general baseline rules are, are similar. What was interesting, a friend of mine, when I mentioned this to them, said, uh, you know, and you made me think of this, Eric, because you talked about you having a copy and I have a copy. My friend said, what if your copy is better than my copy? <laughs> and I, I thought that was an interesting kind of natural place for the mind to go, but I, I'm not sure that's necessarily a valid or, or a concern that one needs to really overly think about. Because look, every time I sit down and play any game, even like, look, this is the exact same copy, right? You buy it, you're going to have the exact same contents. But when I play it, it's going to be a totally different experience than when you play it, just based on who you're with. <laughs> let alone the, the, the components themselves that are in there. Assuming that the game is generally the same kind of thing, a survival game, then every scenario is going to play out differently anyway. So I don't know that I would sit around worrying, is my copy going to be better than somebody else's? And you brought up a really good point, Eric. You could swap copies when you're done, even, if you want to try it in a different environment. That seems like a, I don't know, it just seems really cool and, again, innovative. I might prefer being in the mountains versus the jungle, though, man. So... Your copy might be better than mine. <laughs> well, that's true. <laughs> yes. Well, it's interesting, too, because you don't know where you're going, apparently. You know, you don't, oh, I'm in the jungle now. How did I end up here? Yeah. I guess you, you just magically found yourself there. I thought it was at high elevations, but no, I'm in a swamp. This game, this game sounds like bad news for me. I know, because you're going to want every copy of the game to make one giant set that you'll have it all. I That's unfortunately sad, but true. Um, it'll it'll probably be easier to do than the Keyforge for you, though. You'll just have to buy a few copies and assemb collate them to get one complete set. With like 50 copies. We're going to show up at BGG Con, and the library is just going to be full of boxes Dude, of discovery. Get a, uh, a discovery. You get a discovery. You get a discovery. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, like, I... I feel like I can avoid the allure the lore of um of Keyforge because I'm not really a dueling deck player kind of guy these days or not as much uh, but Discovery I saw it I'm like oh no I just saw it I'm like oh I could just see it I want to I want to really see how different it is I'm like a little <laughs> skeptical but I think it sounds like it's going to be really interesting so I'm trying to keep my excitement level down a little bit just to avoid getting sucked in yeah right how different are things going to be like i'm going to run into a right-handed lumberjack named jacques and you're going to run into a left-handed lumberjack named jack like that's those are unique but how Jock. different are they really <laughs> look oh, those Jock. guys have very separate lives you should not compare them they have their own special unique life yeah i'm, I'm looking forward to it. when when's the release date for that one is that this year q4 2018 around the corner which keyforge is also due out q4 and they haven't given more specifics at that at this point in kickstarter news about 20 projects launched today as of this recording but one stuck out to me that i can speak about with some authority because i played the original version of the game and it's the ancient world by ryan lockett and if you played that one this is now the second edition i don't know exactly what he's changed from first edition to second edition but i really enjoyed first edition um with the worker placement, with the workers have levels. So you have like a level three worker, a level two worker, level one worker, and you worker placement game. But then you also fight these giant titans. So it's got attacking in the game too. It sounds attacky. It is attacky, but you're not attacking each other. You're attacking the titans. However, there is a little bit of the, what I call the Euro conflict, where you get to take some worker action spaces before other people and block them out. So that's the extent of the conflict for that one. But it, it's got Ryan Lockett's artwork, which is f fantastic. And it's, it's not in the world of Above and Below and and the other things, but it has the same art, artistic style, which is amazing. So go check out The Ancient World 2nd Edition for Kickstarter. Cool. Well, that wraps up another huge episode of the Board Game Geek Show. Thank you, everybody, for watching. We really appreciate all the comments and the thumbs and the subscriptions and all of it and the sharing. And thank you again to my lovely co-hosts, Steph Hodge, Lincoln Damerst. Yay! Ronnie Smith, and W. Eric Martin. Bye, everyone. See you later. Bye.
We'll see you guys next time.